Hello friends, how are you? My name is Ari Thurger and today I'm going to talk about the Earth Cult, the cult of the domestic fire. During the season of Yol, in my honest opinion, the spirit of the season should be focused on spending time with the community, with our families, with people that mean something to us, and take the opportunity to strengthen the bonds of love and friendship we have with others. So that's exactly why I would like to talk about the Earth Cult, which is a domestic worship, which not only was practiced by pre-Christian Germanic and Norse peoples, and also Anglo-Saxons, but a great variety of Indo-European cultures. The Earth Cult is perhaps one of the most ancient forms of worshipping that's still alive nowadays and being brought to neo-pagan religions once again. Just before we start this video, I just want to recommend the video I have done about the cult of the ancestors, because the Earth cult is intimately connected to the sacred fire, to the domestic spiritual entities, including gods and spirits, and of course connected with the ancestors. On that video you might find useful information about the cult of the sacred fire within domestic boundaries. Let's start this video. The hearth, the fireplace, this section of the house where the fire burns, has always been related to loads of religious and spiritual concepts of great significance. Of course, the cult of the domestic fire has been progressively put aside. Nowadays, there isn't the actual need of having a living fire inside our houses. Times change and our pagan spiritual perspectives have the tendency to follow the reality we live in. But the domestic fire was one of the largest and most important polytheistic practices of the native peoples of virtually every region of the planet, but particularly developed in the Proto-Indo-European context. Because Indo-European cultures are generally all worshippers of fire, and fire was the primary object of sacred relevance. It is a natural continuation of more archaic practices and was gradually replaced by idols and statues, but it was used both as the representation of a divine entity and as a vehicle with which the divine communicates with us and we communicate with the divine. We can imagine the great changes that took place on the minds of early humans when they came in contact with fire and were able to control it. It was precisely through fire that early humans had an outstanding jump towards evolution. Fire was the element that brought people together. To cook food, to be near a source of light and protection, Different tribes, different communities would gather around each other's fires and would share their stories, knowledge, different techniques, developing languages and ideas. Fire was the great booster of social interactions. And sharing knowledge, humans rapidly evolved. Just imagine the simple idea of different tribes or different members of the community exploring the landscape and at night coming together to share their new findings. Fire became the symbol of knowledge, the great symbol of the community, where people would gather around it, having that feeling of safe space, comfort, illumination, protection. This prehistoric past remained in our collective consciousness. Still nowadays, in this era of great evolution of our urban centers and this stressful life we, we have in our cities, as human beings, in historical terms, we have still spent more time in the wilds rather than in our civilized urban centers. We aren't fully domesticated, it's impossible. Civilizations and great urban centers exist for roughly 10,000 years in small pockets across the globe, but for the great majority, a more domesticated way of living within our civilizations has roughly 5,000 years. While historically speaking, we have a history of closer to 3 million years of being wild. 
So prehistoric concepts are still very much alive inside us, in our collective ancestral memory. Which is why this concept of the sacred domestic fire is still easily understood in a spiritual sense. For instance, I would like to give you a, a quick idea on the Norse concept of Hutangardr and Hinangardr. Gardr means region, space, dwelling place, a land. Hutan and Hut is something that is in the exterior, beyond the boundaries, exactly the same concept of Utgardr, said to be the land of giants in Norse myths. And Inan is the interior, that which lives inside and circled by something, within the boundaries. So I'm sure you already got the point. In early pre-Christian Scandinavian religious concepts, there is this worldview and notion of the inside and the outside. Essentially, Inangardr is what is inside where the people of the interior are all bound by the same tribal customs, laws and religious practices. On the other hand, uh, those in Hutengardr were not bound by these customs and were not protected by tribal unity, so they were outlaws. The exterior was considered a place of savagery and chaos, where wild and untamable animals and spirits lived and it was a dangerous place. The same concept of the domestic fire, the fire of the community, being safe around the fire and with the community. And out there in the wild places the dangers were very real. Fire was knowledge and outside it existed the unknown. This is why Halsgard, the realm of the Haesir, was encircled by a wall, and outside it, it was Hutgarda, the wild landscape of giants and creatures of chaos. Before the concept of the Nine Worlds is given to us, the pre-Christian Scandinavian cosmology was divided into these two realities, inside and outside. This is very much like what the Romans did when tracing the perimeter for the foundations of a new city. It was a highly religious act, literally carving on the earth the perimeter of their cities, to delineate the space of the living, the civilized space, and outside it was the space of the gods, the space of mysteries and the unknown. And this also gives us a better perception on the Norse tradition of sending away from the community criminals. They became outlaws, unable to live inside the community, unable to respect the laws of the community. So they were sent out of it, into the outside, the unknown and chaos. They were considered Varga, wolves, because they were outside the boundaries of the safe space, therefore they became wild creatures. He who was outlawed was placed out of the law, that is, expelled from the community. From the society. The old English term butan, which means outlaw, literally meant without law or outside the law. They could be killed, hunted down by the community because they no longer belong to the community. They became wild beasts. They could not even receive a decent burial or cremation. They were foreigners of the law and therefore out of society. So in Germanic and Norse cultures, we still have this prehistoric concept of a world view based on the concepts of outside and inside. The safe space around the fire, the earth, and the dangerous places outside the earth, outside the community. The fireplace we have in our homes, for those lucky enough to have it, is the most basic example of the domestic sacred fire and the representation of controlled flame. Obviously, it, it has numerous practical functions, but the key point here is its religious associations uh, that we may not be aware of, but to reach this point of having a fireplace in our houses, there was a long history of spirituality concerning this natural element. According to the Welsh law, someone would only take the legal possession of a land only when a fire was lit in the hearth of that person and the smoke came from the chimney. A symbolical act of settling for good in that land. 
The association between private property and the element of fire was so strong that in terms of the Welsh law, the right of an heir to occupy his father's land and properties was called the right to discover fire. We have archaeological evidences in Celtic dwellings where in some houses that were abandoned voluntarily and not destroyed or and, and forgotten, the fireplace of such dwellings right in the center of the main room were deliberately and ritually dismantled, which gives us an indication of the possibility that when dwellings were abandoned, people probably literally took the fireplace with them as a symbol of carrying with them the most sacred part of the house, that which marked the very spirit of the home and the flame of the ancestors, to later on, wherever they settled again, place the fireplace in a ritualistic act of a new beginning, marking the land as theirs, placing their ancestors and the entire spirit of the community in the new land. This is not as far-fetched as it seems. To the Greeks and Romans, there was the, f the, the family cult, the domestic worship, which was focused on the worshipping of the ancestors, centered in the house, in the sacred fire held within the property, keeping the fire al alive and active as a source of light, but also as a source of energy provided by the dead ancestors. The sacred fire was later associated with the goddess Vesta, the goddess of the domestic fire, the Earth. The fire was constantly being fed and protected by the Vestal Virgins, the priestesses of Vesta, who protected the sacred fire of Rome, never to let it extinguish, constantly feeding the flames to keep Rome protected and safe. Still this idea of maintaining the source of light and warmth, which was the symbol of the community. The fire of Vesta was the heart of Rome. And in Greece there was the eternal fires of Hestia in their round temple, also a virgin goddess of the, of the home and the hearth. There is always this purity implicit in the sacred fire. In this domestic cult there was a specific law similar to the previous examples I gave you. The house where the ancestral fire resided could not be sold or passed on to third parties. This property did not belong to a single individual or the family currently residing there, but to the lineage, the bloodline of the ancestors, and therefore it was not permitted to get rid of this property, this space where the house of the ancestors was and the sacred fire resided. The, the sacred fire connected to the ancestors marked that the property that property as belonging to the family who kept the fire lit. In the Vedic religion, there's also a um, this domestic cult of the sacred fire and the laws of property connected to the domestic fire. We have Indo-European evidences in the Far East about this. Under the Vedic law, a new territory was legally incorporated with the construction of an altar to the fire god Agni. And the similar law in Iran until at least the 3rd century of our era. These early Indo-European laws have this notion that a place belongs to a group whose fire burns in that place. We have other examples such as in Lithuania, there was the cult of taking care of the fire of the god Perkonas, which was cared for by women who were killed if the fire went out. Now this was just another example, so you might have uh, a perception of this Indo-European cult around the domestic fire and the sacred fire noticeable in different regions of the ancient Indo-European territories. So we already noticed that there was a certain type of law connected with fire, which was shared among many Indo-European peoples. Um, the, the illumination of a fire legalized the possession of a land and that the reverse factor, the extinction of the fire, ends with the possession of something. Fire was a marker of civilization, protection, power, the living heart of the community. And as previously demonstrated, in a worldview perception of inside and outside, the fire is right in the middle of this worldview and everything happened around it. All life turns around the fire.
which is why many cultures, even to this day, have their celebrations and dances around the fire, going in circles, almost as if the ancient civilization, civilizations had realized without technology that indeed our own world turns around the sun, uh, this great source of illumination and energy that provides life to our own world. Maybe our ancestors knew. There's no reason to believe that we nowadays are on a higher intellectual level than our ancestors were. Something we should also retain from this cult around the sacred fire is the feminine religious connotations to the preservation of the fire. In Scandinavia, we have absolutely no idea if the hearth cult was performed by women, or at least the keeping of the fire. It's true that Scandinavian cultures, uh, through time, became more patriarchal. A great percentage of Bronze Age engravings in Scandinavia are related to the male figure, and this doesn't change when there is a leap from Iron Age to Viking Age. There is an increasing social activity around the male figure, or the male gender. However, women during the Viking Age played very important roles, specially connected to religious and magical practices. And we must also take in mind that the celebration of the Sablot was a celebration entirely focused on the female figure, so it's very probable that women were involved in the preservation of the fire of the community and also the domestic fire. Judging by other European cultures such as Roman, Greek, Lithuanian, Far Eastern Indo-European regions, as I have previously mentioned, as well as other cultures that I won't develop uh, in this video, but Slavic cultures of nowadays Romania, Bulgaria and so on, the fire of the community and in temples was kept by women, either virgins or widows, always this detachment from any relationship with other, well, other people, because they had to remain loyal to the sacred fire, a male element maintaining the purity of the entire sacred performances around the sacred fire. Much like what we have with Christianity, actually. Uh, priests and nuns remain, technically in many cases, remain pure and unmarried to dedicate their lives to God. It was much the same thought within the Indo-European mind and many ancient cultures towards the Arth cult, the cult of the domestic fire. But this reality is much more evident when taking care of the fire of the community. Because the domestic fire was still kept by women, but they were married and therefore they were taking care of the fire of their husbands, the heart of the home of their husbands. Which is why in Scandinavia the hearth cult was also pro probably held by women. They protected and kept the flame alive within their own properties. The Arth cult does not require a formalized priesthood. Traditionally, this role may have been filled by the head of the family in Scandinavia. But with the limited number of people involved in domestic worship and within the polytheistic traditional identity, it is possible that anyone within the household would be willing to assume the role. Although there is a more um, but a greater inclination to have been practiced by the women of the family, judging by the various examples of other European cultures. Be that as it may, the intent of the hearth cult is to keep active and in a certain way alive the tutelary deities, intercessory deities, domestic gods and the ancestral dead. Primarily concerning the ancestors, the domestic sacred fire serves to let them know that they still have a place in their home. Deep down, the Arth cult becomes a range of obligations that you have to perform in order to keep the religious life within your house healthy and alive and good spiritual functioning within the home. And in a more, let's say, romantic view, our houses are also the reflection of our own inner worlds. So in a way, it's made as a reflection or an image of the universe and the cosmological compositions of our own spiritual beliefs. So our houses are our temples, and the domestic fire is our own representation of the sacred, 
of the Divine Presence. Our ancestors, when it came to build their dwellings, it was almost a process of building a private religious sanctuary. And men engaged with the sacred within the comfort and safety of their own dwellings. In most cultures, the private domains had a round configuration, resembling the perception of the world. Not that our ancestors were fully aware that the earth was round, maybe they, they were, but it seems more likely to be the representation of the world view I've spoken earlier, in circles, of in and out. So the inside of the house is the safe place, this dwelling in form of a circle representing the boundaries of safety. In the center of the house there was the supporting pillar, not just a requirement in the foundations of the house, but also the representation of the world pillar, which in many Indo-European cosmologies is represented by a world tree supporting the various realities of inside the circle and outside the circle. The central pillar of the house supports our private world, as the world tree supports the world itself. And through that pillar, there is a connection between the divine. So this helps to understand our houses as sacred private spaces, where we keep the sacred fire alive, which marks the presence of the divine in our lives. This very Indo-European perception of the sacred domestic fire in the earth cult. Now, to finalize this, the earth cult or other form of domestic worship is not really widely spoken within the hidden communities, primarily because it is a domestic and more private worship, and the neo-pagan reconstructions of today are more focused on celebrations of the community rather than on private celebrations. Each individual is as different as the interior of their own homes. They have different gods, ancestors, familiar spirits, different religious and spiritual goals, different forces that exercise authority over the sacred sphere, and of course different approaches to worship. Therefore, a home worship, something much more private in spiritual terms, is perfectly understandable that it's not wildly spoken in modern pagan communities whose aim is to create a community and focus on the collective instead of the beauty of the individual and the unique role of the individual in the community. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. Happy celebrations with your family members or with yourself and your pets. It doesn't matter. Just remember that well, just remember to keep the fire alive within your home. Once again, thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And, bye for now.